uh, in consideration to be your next superintendent, Steve Archibald. Thank you for the questions that have been submitted via email. Uh, the board enlisted the services of the Michigan Leadership Institute to facilitate this search process. I'm John Silveri of the Michigan Leadership Institute. I'll give Mr. Archibald a brief opportunity to introduce himself and give some introductory remarks, and, and then we'll get to your questions. Uh, we'll get through as many questions as possible before the scheduled ending time of 7 o'clock. Duplicate questions were eliminated, just so you know that. And I do want to stress that uh, questions represent the unique perspectives of those who submitted them and should be taken as such. Just a reminder to participants, you're strongly encouraged to please provide feedback to the Board of Education afterward via the interview feedback form link that was provided in your invitation to participate and is up on the district website as well. Although it's the responsibility of the board to select the new superintendent, your perspective is important and your feedback I know will be very greatly appreciated. So having said that, Mr. Archibald, please. Thank you, Mr. Silveri, and good evening to everyone. I uh, greatly appreciate uh, your time and attention today and those that, that sent in questions. Uh, certainly one of the most uh, important decisions that the Board of Education has to make and um, the amount of staff and community interest um, and input um, for uh, for me has been exciting and encouraging to see. And that, uh, as we all know, that um, it, that collective effort, both as a district and the community and parents, is, is what makes this such a, a tremendous district. So uh, it is encouraging and exciting to see the the level of interest and participation. Uh, uh, just to provide a little bit of my background, and Mr. Severi, I apologize. This is probably now the fourth time that uh, you have, have heard this. So if I misspeak, you can jump in and, and correct me. But uh, starting with family, because family to me is, is most important. Uh, I do live in, in uh, New Hudson, moved out here with my wife and two daughters about uh, three and a half years ago. And um, my wife and I have been married almost 27 years. Uh, she is also in education. She has a degree in physical education and currently oversees health and physical education for Livonia Public Schools. Uh, my two daughters, uh, my oldest is a first year kindergarten uh, teacher and um, my youngest uh, re graduated virtually from Michigan State uh, this past uh, Friday. So um, we're trying to take advantage of this uh, crazy situation that we're living through to have my two older daughters uh, in the home and enjoying as much family time uh, as we can. Um, professionally, I graduated from Central Michigan University in 1988. Uh, that was a time when the job market was uh, pretty thin uh, for, for teachers. And so I had the opportunity, I subbed in uh, Dearborn Public Schools for about a year and a half before I was fortunate enough to be hired uh, as a math and physical education teacher at Frost Middle School uh, in uh, Livonia Public Schools. Uh, if you aren't familiar, uh, Livonia uh, is about a, uh, they have 24 schools, about 14,000 students and 1,900 uh, staff, an annual budget of about 150, $155 million. So I, I just throw those numbers out just to give you the perspective with, re with regards to uh, my experience and, and where I've been. Uh, my first three years was layoff, recall, layoff, recall, layoff, recall. And, and in my third year, I ended up at Churchill High School uh, where I taught mathematics for two years. I've also coached a variety of sports, including football, uh, basketball, and baseball. During my fourth year, I had the opportunity, one of our administrators moved to central office. And so the principal came to me and I had the opportunity to serve as an interim assistant principal for the final eight years of the school year, expecting wholeheartedly that I would take that experience, learn from it what I could, continue on with my master's program and, and return back to teaching coaching for a period of time uh, before pursuing administration. And um, they went through a round of interviews. They didn't make a selection. I wasn't an eligible candidate because I'd be candidate because I didn't have my master's degree. And I got a call from human resources and they asked Steve, how quickly can you get your degree? So. I went that summer, I took classes in, in Willow Run, Ypsilanti, Flint, and Traverse City. I finished my master's, I interviewed uh, and got the position. I spent six years as an assistant principal at Churchill High School, uh, responsible for pupil accounting, as well as uh, building the master schedule. 
I moved over, was selected in 2000 to be the principal at Stevenson High School and spent 11 uh, wonderful years there. And then moving over to central office, there was a retirement uh, and superintendent at the time, Randy Leopa, uh, asked me to come over and join his staff as the director of secondary programs uh, and district services. The position was later elevated to an assistant principal. Um, and there I was ultimately responsible for the secondary program, which involves uh, three middle schools, three high schools, a career technical center, our athletic program, adult education, shared time, uh, K-12 art, K-12 music, and a host of other uh, programs. And then most recently, the superintendent asked me to assume the responsibilities of the you know, assistant superintendent of human resources, which is what I've been doing for the, the last uh, two and a half years. So again, uh, that's a little bit of my background, both personally, professionally. And again, I, I really appreciate everyone here tonight and look forward to, uh, uh, to the question and answers. All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, so the first question is from Terry Castron, who is a parent. How do you intend to communicate with your community members and parents and students? And how frequently would this communication, would you be communicating? Yeah, Terry, that's a, an excellent question. Communication uh, is is paramount to what, what we're doing. Um, we have to take advantage of a variety of modes of communication, uh, whether that's uh, promoting something through social media, our district website, newsletters, emails, uh, you know, phone uh, blasts and whatnot. So uh, a work to communicate with folks in a variety of different ways. And again, that's that's communication uh, from me or or from the district. I, I think what's important with that, while we'll use a, a, a number of modes to communicate, I think we also have to be consistent so that folks don't have to hunt for information. If you're looking for school closure information, you know where to go. You're looking for COVID-19 information, you know where to go. You're looking for safety and security information, you know where to go. So we need to be consistent, but also utilizing a variety of, of our modes of communication. Um, I expect to be in our schools and interacting with our students and staff a great deal. You will find me at uh, school events. I need to be more than just an attendee at the event, but an opportunity to uh, interact with parents, interact with students, and, and get to know people. So it, it has to be very engaging and very interactive. I have to be approachable, and, and uh, I think folks will see that about my, my personality and my demeanor. Um, and as well, in living in the community, uh, the opportunity when I, when I see people uh, at a golf course, at a store, at a restaurant, that they feel comfortable approaching me or I feel comfortable approaching them, saying hello, wishing them well, and, and, and providing an, an open ear. Uh, we may not be able to address whatever their issue is at that particular time in that format, but I want to be able to make that connection um, and be able to follow up uh, at, a, at a later time. Uh, also, um, something I've been a, a part of in Livonia a great deal, whether they're making their budget decisions, our bond decisions, um, our safety and security decisions, we we host, and I found great value in holding community forums, parent forums, and uh, student forums. Some of our great work that we did, we were in a little bit of a stall pattern in some of our climate and culture work and had been working on it for a while. And we ended up pulling student focus groups together. And at the time I was a secondary director, the secondary director and the elementary director, we went down to the schools and we talked to the students about what it meant to feel emotionally safe at school and how they felt. And it was really the feedback from our students that put us on the chart that we've been on the last four years uh, towards um, our respectful interactions and, and culture work and establishing a, a, a healthy and positive climate and culture in our schools. So again, that information needs to be, a, it needs to be a two-way street. You need to be able to rely on, on accurate and confident information in a very timely manner uh, from our district, um, but also uh, an opportunity to provide uh, feedback and making sure that uh, uh, you have avenues, avenues to do that. I will certainly be accessible. Thank you. Uh, this question is from Michael King, who is uh, a parent. Give three examples in your current position where you fought to reduce a material budget item in your district. Uh, 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking so that I can. John, can you re repeat that one more time? Sure. I want to make sure I understand the question because if I don't, I'm going to go off on a tangent and that may be even worse than my actual answer. <laughs> sure. Give three examples in your current position where you fought to reduce a material budget item in your district. I, I'll be very honest with you, Mr. King. What I'm struggling with is, is in my mind, recognizing what a, um, a material budget item uh, might be, and that's I'm, I'm I'm struggling to to articulate an answer or response to that to your question. So I I apologize for that. And, and um, if it's all right with you, Mr. Severi, um, I would ask that we we move on to a couple other questions, and I'll come back to that. I, I, what I want to, I don't want to go off on a tangent. And again, I apologize, Mr. King, you took the time to, to ask the question and, and uh, for whatever reason, it's not registering with me. We can certainly move on. That's just fine. Um, this next question is from Donna Chakubik, uh, a community member. As a parent of three Southline graduates, our experience identified a lack of consistency across district high schools and middle schools, as well as between the same class in the same school with different teachers. This was especially apparent within the math department where differences existed in pacing, assessments, and allowable supports such as calculator use. How do you envision supporting the South Lion teachers in creating professional learning communities? Yeah, we're actually uh, doing a lot of work on that. And that's a, that's a, a wonderful question in terms of the, the consistency because our, our students, they need to be exposed to and have opportunity for the same curriculum and experiences regardless which school in our community they're attending and regardless you know algebra one needs to be algebra one in classroom 301 and classroom 302 um, where it may differ in, in the art of, of teaching and 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 how it is delivered and, and whatnot is, is certainly there but what our students are experiencing um, we need to work hard as a school community to make sure that there is as much consistency in that as possible so that again our, our students are getting the same uh, quality and, and rich um, environment uh, through professional learning communities and and i honestly think the work that or what we've had to go through um, over the past couple months in essentially reinventing our in, uh, delivery model for instruction um, is really going to be a resurgence to establishing plcs um, I, i'll be candid and i don't know exactly to what extent they exist um, in South Lyon. Uh, we've been working on them uh, in Livonia. Uh, I have attended um, the, the heartland of professional learning communities in Lincolnshire, Illinois, uh, on two different occasions. Was scheduled to go back there this summer. I believe wholeheartedly in that work, in the idea that we need to understand you know, what it is that we want students to learn and what we want them to learn needs to be consistent throughout our, our entire, entire system, as well as what we're going to do when they aren't learning it and that we have a system of supports in place and that that doesn't it isn't so uh, individual teacher dependent but we have a system of responses so that we're responding to folks um, consistently it doesn't mean that it's going to be the same or cookie cutter through every classroom but in order to be efficient in our support and our resources we need to have those consistencies and i think that that starts from the superintendent's office and our central office uh, cabinet in making sure that folks have clear understanding of what the expectations are and then the support and resources to uh, meet those expectations. So again, um, it's not just South Lion, if you, as you point out, uh, those inconsistencies um, and that exist everywhere, it's, it's a real issue. And I think that uh, um, it's something that we, should and will focus on as a district again for no other reason but to make sure that all of our students are afforded the same uh, quality and rich education opportunity thank you uh, this question is from colin dominguez parents uh, who's feeling that there was a lack of direction and clarity after the start of the pandemic school shutdown 
Uh, in his view, some teachers immediately began implementing virtual classrooms and virtual teacher office hours, uh, while others did not. Um, even now, implementation has been more of a hodgepodge of packets and one or two hours of virtual class time um, with limited teacher oversight of the work product. How do you envision the future of the virtual classroom in light of new spacing standards, and how do you expect to hold teachers accountable in the age of remote classrooms? Yeah, this is a the crazy reality that we're that we're in right now. Um, and this is really, I think, where where all of our minds are at, whether you're educators or parents. Um, our world's been turned upside down in, in a variety of different ways. Uh, we've been um, forced to change our instructional delivery method uh, in a relatively short period of time in a, in a relatively uh, in an in absolutely remote um, environment. So I think to be very honest, is, is this started? Um, it's been very much like uh, drinking from a from a fire hose. And about every time we feel that we have our legs underneath us, um, something else in the circumstance shifts. That being said, I think I know if we've been able to do what we've done in this short a period of time, although we don't know exactly what the beginning of the school year is going to look like, by comparison, we have a lot more time to get something in place and we have a much better starting point with where we are right now. So wherever we are, we're starting and we're in a much better position to be prepared for the start of this coming school year. Uh, I think what we need to be doing is making sure, uh, one, that as a district, we do have clear and concise and expectations for our staff. We need to make sure that we're providing the necessary training so that they are able to meet those expectations and providing the appropriate remote instruction. We need to also make sure that we're communicating with our parents and with our students and meeting and supporting their needs as well. Uh, it, 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 you know, it, this, through this entire thing, again, every time, you know, there were, there are new, new challenges coming around the horizon. And so I, I think what's been most impressive and what I've seen is the way folks continue to work together. And like you're bringing up these challenges, you're not bringing them up in order to, to complain or, or um, you're bringing them to light so that then the folks who are working on these things, or at least this is how I will take it, that the folks who are working on these things can take that information and work to make it better. We only have one perspective from the school side, we, we, but we need that feedback from parents and we need that feedback from students to understand if the vision and what we're trying to accomplish is really the way things are playing out. In my current district, we're talking about providing surveys at some point in the near future to parents to get their feedback on how things are going, how we can support them, and things we might want to consider as we move forward. I think we can all agree, while we may not know exactly what school is going to look like in the fall, it's not going to look like we did when we left on March 12th or March 13th. It's going to be somewhere in between, whether it's you know, a hybrid of remote and, and in-person instruction. We're going to have, as you mentioned, uh, the uh, safety protocols, uh, whatever they are, that we're going to make have to make sure that we're able to adhere to and follow. So there, there's a lot to this Rubik's Cube that, that we have yet to figure out. But we need to be able to work together, get information, get input from all of our community, and work to do this effectively and as best we can. The good news is, this isn't something we're doing alone. It's every school district across the county, across the state, and and throughout the country. Um, and so, you know, th this is this is real. This is stuff we need to be working on right now. I think right now we're still in a position we have more questions than answers. Um, but again, um, we're in a much better starting point than we were two months ago, and and we need to work to make sure that we, we will work to make sure that we have a uh, a clear plan and a well-communicated plan, a well-implemented plan, but also realizing that if there's parts of that that aren't playing out the way we think they ought to or should have, then we'll need to make adjustments. If anyone's expecting us to be perfect from the gate, I'll apologize in advance, we won't be. 
I will guarantee you as a district, we're going to do our absolute best to make sure that we're putting out the best instructional program, whether it's face to face or remotely. We'll listen to you. We'll hear you and, and we'll make adjustments all along the way, because like you, we want it to be the best in terms of the educational program and services for our students. Thank you. This question is from Kim DeNoyer, who is a parent. Where do you see opportunities to improve the statewide rankings of the South Lyon School District? What specifically do you plan to do to make the South Lyon School District more competitive on a statewide basis? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Neuer. I, I think one of the things that we'll need to look at or begin looking at, if, if you aren't already, is, is look at where we are at in terms of our, if I'm assuming you're referring to test scores and, and where our test scores place us um, within the tri-county area, within Oakland County. There are certainly um, some excellent marker schools and districts within that um, by which to compare ourselves. Um, but I think more than a comparison, we may stack up very well by comparison and could very well still be underachieving where we should be. So we need to focus on, on where we are and where we, where we aspire to be with respect uh, to our test scores. As we look at those, at our scores, we need to study trends um, and make sure that our, our test scores are trending in a positive direction. We need to make sure that where we are falling down, whether it's at a particularly grade level in a particular content area, that we're working as a district to identify what the problem areas are, whether it's in curriculum, whether it's instruction, development, resources, whatever it is, and work to fill those gaps again so we can you know, maybe stand a negative trend and, and begin turning um, in, in, the other, in the other direction. I think the, the areas that I've seen in looking at uh, some of the test scores, uh, two areas that, that stand out to me, and they both have to do with achievement gaps. Um, and this is not unique to South Lyon, but if you look at, if you compare almost across the board, uh, our test scores for our students with disabilities and our test scores for the economically disadvantaged students, uh, there is a considerable gap between students overall. And in some cases, the trend for one or both of those subgroups is actually widening that gap. So I think that's a very um, obvious place. It's an area that, that folks are trying to tackle, um, again, all the way across the state, but we need to break it down into pieces. I think we need to not get wrapped up in really what the test scores are. Those are an end result. We need to look at our programs and our services and, and make sure that those are aligned with getting uh, the desired uh, test scores that, uh, that we want as a as a community. Thank you. Um, from Brad Gibbons, a parent, what is your ideal classroom size for our K through 12 classes? How would you achieve that goal without building new schools? Was that, uh, I heard art, but was that? No, I'm sorry, let, let me repeat that. Um, okay. What is your ideal classroom size for our K-12 classes? And how would you achieve that goal without building new schools? It's a, uh, an interesting, I, I'm gonna go with a general answer, which is I would, I would work to have smaller class sizes, um, especially at the, at the earlier grades. Um, you know, I, I can put out numbers based on the class sizes that we have, uh, in, Le in Livonian that I'm most familiar with. Um, I will say this, that, that those numbers and those class sizes don't happen in isolation. We will work very hard within uh, our, our budget uh, and, and space allowed to keep our class sizes uh, as, as low as possible. And again, I would focus on the earlier grades uh, in the work I've been involved in uh, at the secondary level. We work very hard to keep uh, the class sizes uh, low across the board, certainly as much as we can, but in our entry level uh, classes, say in, in, in the ninth grade and, and, uh, and alike. So it, it really depends on in, at the secondary level in the content area um, and so forth. But I, I'm, I'm, I don't have ex exact numbers 
for you because there's a lot of factors that go into that. But I am I'm, uh, certainly in tune with the idea of maintaining as low a class size as possible. We put a lot of staffing and, and resources into um, our classes in, in Livonia um, to achieve that, that very thing. Thank you. Uh, this is from Ann Krushka. That, uh, just, a very, just a, a piece I, I kind of left out. As opposed to building schools, uh, I'll go back to some work I've done in, in Livonia where we had a, a building utilization study and we were literally studying all of our areas. So there are there may be, and I haven't been in all the schools, there may be areas of our of our buildings that are designed to be used as classrooms, but over time aren't being used as classrooms. So in terms of you know not needing to build other schools, um, I think it's maximizing uh, the space that we have um, with within our schools. Um, I'm going to avoid the boundary uh, word uh, because I don't have enough history on the district in terms of boundaries. But um, certainly, if that's problematic in terms of where our populations are in the schools that that they're attending, as sensitive a topic as that is, um, it's something that I think we would need to uh, to broach as a community. Again, um, I'm not that familiar with the circumstance, but um, that that could be an issue or factor or some way to address it. Thank you. So from Ann Krushka, who's uh, a parent, and it's a lengthy question. Uh, I'm reluctant to shorten it too much, so I'll, I'll go through the question, and I'm happy to repeat any part of it or all of it if you need me to. Many parents are looking ahead to the 2021 school year and expressing concerns about whether there will be face-to-face -face instruction in school. It's a very real possibility that a spike in COVID-19 cases could force us back to online instruction. Private schools are offering their students a full curriculum. Our high school students are competing with these private school students for spots at prestigious universities. Specifically at the high school level, many parents want their students to have access to the complete curriculum, especially in math, science, English, foreign language, and AP classes. How confident are you that you can lead our district to offer curriculum at the pace of traditional face-to-face -face instruction should a pause or end to face-to-face -face instruction become an issue for the next school year, including uh, providing parents access to IT support? That, that's an, an excellent question. Uh, I'll, I'll answer you very, very candidly. Um, in terms of making that commitment, I'm, I'm too far removed from my current position to know what our ability to pull that off is. And what the one thing, um, that I would not want to do here tonight in answering an interview question is give you an answer that I believe you want to hear in order to give you a good answer, be selected and have a phone conversation with you because I've fallen short on what I promised you uh, we'd be able to deliver. So I, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop short of doing that. What I can tell you is um, if, if there are other parochial schools, private schools, uh, wherever there are that are able to do this, then one thing that we need to be able to do is to see how they're doing it. Because if they're able to pull that off, um, then we have something to learn from that. Our objective through this is to maintain as much of a whole instructional program as we possibly can. That is in the best interest of our students, um, no question with regard to their learning and, and moving forward, especially at the secondary level. Um, one thing that would come to mind to me, and I don't know to the extent that you're using online learning, uh, there are uh, courses provided provided for that you can take through what's called a, an online statewide catalog uh, in the state of Michigan. And it counts as, as one of the students, um, uh, six courses that they're taking at the high school to the extent that we would utilize um, what's called 21F for the online le uh, learning through Michigan Virtual um, is, is something that we may have to consider in order to be providing a, a full program. Uh, but again, um, I, I don't want to give you tonight an empty promise because I, I believe I understand what you're looking for, but I can tell you as a school community, we're always going to be working to provide as complete uh, a program and education as we can for our students. These are extremely unique situations, but they require then an extremely unique uh, solution. And if we get the right people in the room, including members of the community, 
We learn from others around us. And again, you mentioned schools that are that are providing it. Um, then, then we should be having conversation and, and watching and learning and, and, and taking from them uh, what we can in, in our plan. Can I ask this as a follow-up because it was part of that question. But there's another one too from from a, a, a different parent that that is similar. So I want to make sure we hit that, and that is um, ensuring that all students and uh, parents have access to the technology that they need. Thank you. That that's a, an excellent follow-up, and I think was actually in that question, and, and I and I missed it. Um, that's something that. It, you've probably heard the phrase, it's come out in terms of, of equity of access. And that's been something that, that has um, come up, I'm sure in South Lyon, it hasn't in Livonia and other districts. And we'll need to make sure if they aren't already looking at it, and I would imagine that they are, how we can as a district provide uh, mobile devices or help our families get mobile devices. You know, one of the reality, and you're dealing with it at home if you have, if you have children at home, and I keep looking down, making eye contact here, and the camera's up here, so I apologize. Um, we we were allowing mobile devices to be signed out, and and that was working well. But if you're in a if you're in a home where the parents are both working from home, and multiple children are trying to get online, they're they're fighting for devices and whatnot. So whether we can partner uh, with our with uh, members of the community to to have funds to provide hotspots, we we've been successful at doing that in Livonia. Uh, and uh, mobile devices, but that that connectivity um, is important. It's interesting though. Now we're actually getting feedback from from some parents saying, "Can you provide the instructional packets? We have the device, but I'm concerned about the amount of screen time that my child is is spending, and I want them to work uh, on the paper and pencil." So it, it's very an interesting dynamic. But I think ideally we want all of our students to have the same connectivity as possible um, through the technology. The, 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 the way we're doing it now, and we're making the best of the circumstance, but it's if it's uh, a virtual environment for some and a um, paper environment for others, now if that's by choice, that's great. But if it's out of necessity or need, I think as, as a school community and as a community at large, uh, we need to, to work to address that. And definitely before the fall, I don't think it, it's unreasonable to think even if if we had the, the good fortune of opening up face-to-face full-time instruction on the first day of school, at some point next year, at some point in the fall, the idea that we're gonna be down, again, I'm talking absolutely ideal best case scenario, but at some point we may have to pivot for an extended period of time back to virtual instruction. So even if this changed tomorrow and we knew that we could go back to face-to-face -face instruction, we'll need to have a contingency plan again, to pivot back to remote um, and, and, and an even more robust uh, format than it is today. And we'll do that. Thank you. This question is from Lori O'Dell, a parent. We are a rural community with many back roads. Describe your experience with such a community and how you will address inclement weather challenges. My worst experience with this, Lori, is getting from where I live down to Salem Hills Golf Course after a real bad rainstorm and trying to uh, avoid and dodge the, the potholes. So um, I, I, underst I understand that. This would be an area, quite honestly, one of the things in, in, with this question is I would want our operations people to take me around the district and, and uh, our transportation people and, and get to areas of the district that physically I haven't been to um, before, because I, I certainly need to understand that. I think in terms of uh, you know school closures and, and worrying about road conditions, um, early on those mornings, uh, I would envision being out and, and in, you know I'm sure that our transportation operation department have identified the areas out in the community when impacted by, by weather um, are, are, are the areas that we need to pay attention to because you know, if they're okay, other areas are probably okay. Or, or if they're not, you know, what are some of our uh, choke points, if you will, in our in our traffic patterns and our roads? So, I'll have to work with our transportation and operations people to bring myself up to speed um, on on that. But it, it's a very uh, real situation. I appreciate you pointing it out because, to be quite honest with you, in all my preparation, um, I, I don't think that's a question that 
um, that came to mind, but it's a, it's a very uh, uh, real one and it's not one I can wait till a bad snowfall to try and figure out. So I appreciate you putting that on my list for me. Thank you. Uh, this from Andrea O'Keefe, a parent. South Lyon Community Schools went from having a longtime superintendent to a fair amount of shifting in personnel at central office during the past few years, including multiple mid-year departures. What is your vision for how your leadership will provide more long-term continuity for our students, families, staff, and administrators so that we not only maintain the status quo of doing well, but we are truly a school district that exudes excellence in all areas? Yeah. I think in terms of longevity, I'll start with with me as superintendent and, and you've done the math and I think I've said it, I, I have 30 years experience. So an obvious question in that might be, how long is this guy uh, this going to stick around? Um, my intent, if you had asked me this prior to this even starting, I have no less than a decade, uh, 10 years to go in my career, most likely 12. And if my health and, and energy um, hold up, will go longer. I feel myself personally, I'm just starting to come into uh, a stride um, as, as, a, as a leader and as, a, uh, as an educator and feeling that my, the breadth of my experience, um, I still have a lot, a lot to give. Um, so from, a, from the superintendent standpoint, I plan on being here uh, for a very long time. Uh, from a stability standpoint, in terms of the administration, uh, if folks, have the opportunity to move on to uh, higher positions uh, elsewhere or whatnot, um, I think we have to afford them uh, that opportunity. Otherwise, within our current administration, and I don't know the, all the dynamics that has caused all the shifting, um, but what I will look to do is to make sure um, that we have very competent and very capable administrators uh, in their positions and that we're a very high functioning high level team. I think with that stability, um, you will find uh, some longevity. The hardest part for me of leaving my, my current team uh, is the working relationship I have with them. Uh, we are much more like family than we are uh, like coworkers. I will say this though, as we have had turnover uh, in a eight member cabinet, uh, potentially two of us leaving this school year, uh, another school year where three left, we were still able to maintain the continuity, although there was a change in personnel because we were behind a, a consistent vision and expectations. And so while the personnel were changing, the values, beliefs, and priorities of the district were well established and well placed. And I think that, would, that allows us to deal with any changeover without disruption uh, to our programs and services. Thank you. Um, this from Lynn Hensley, who's a, a parent. Do you think it's important or necessary for the superintendent to live in the district? Thank you. This, this must be an uh, important question for uh, folks because it, it was in one of the previous uh, groups as well. Um, I would say this, that I think the board should only choose a candidate if they live in the community. Um, I say that jokingly and self-servingly. Um, honestly, though, in, in all seriousness, I, I don't know that it's a necessity uh, for the majority of my career. I lived in Canton, uh, the obviously working in Livonia. Um, I was more involved with community groups in Livonia where I worked than I was in Canton where I lived. I was more involved with the school groups, obviously, and the PTAs uh, and, and alike than I was in the school groups where my own children uh, went to school. So I don't think it, it's necessary. I think in this case, especially in changing over, um, it, it's certainly advantageous. It's important for me as a member of the community. I live here. I have uh, a vested interest in the well-being uh, of the school district as an ambassador and the face of the district will be out in the community and knowingly never being able to fully take the superintendent hat off and that my actions and interactions with the member of the community i am always representing 
the Board of Education, the school district, our families. And so by, by being in the community, I have the opportunity to do that um, each and every day, um, not just while I'm at work, but uh, you know, while I'm uh, out in the community as well. My wife has told me though, if I have the good fortune of getting this position, I have to start dressing differently when I take the dogs out because um, apparently it's embarrassing. So again, I, I don't know that it's uh, absolutely necessary, um, but uh, I certainly see advantages for me being a member of the, of the community and beginning to uh, forge what are very important relationships for someone coming in new uh, to the district. Thank you. Uh, from Michael Ziegler, parent. South Lyon has an elaborate program for gifted and talented students at the elementary and middle school levels. Some current research suggests these types of separations are not best educational practice. Can you speak to your philosophy regarding such programs and the research you would use as a guide to help reform them? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ziegler. In in Livonia, if you aren't aware, we have gifted and talented programs uh, from elementary um, through high school. Uh, I'm generally not a proponent of tracking. Um, we have uh, we've also done it at, at some of the the uh, lower or remedial levels. But I'll be very honest with you, and I'd be um, uh, interested to see that research because. Anything that the things that I have read and seen, while much of the research speaks against tracking, I, I've not come across any substantial research that speaks against it um, at, at the advanced uh, level. So um, I'd be interested to see that. So again, I, I definitely think that it, that it has its, its place and um, is something that, that we would continue to do and focus on. Again, as a general rule, I, I'm opposed to tracking and, and what I think that does for the learning environment for, for our students. But I, at this point, I'm only aware of research that, that does support it um, at the advanced level. Thank you. Um, from Hattie McGuire, who's a parent, uh, given the foundational importance of solid writing skills, can you tell us about your vision for a system-wide, vertically aligned K-12 approach to writing instruction? Andy, I will be again very honest. Rather, I can. I have two choices here. I can ramble and come up with an answer for you, or I can be very honest and tell you that in all my preparation and in all my my work, I do not have a, a quality answer for you in terms of my thinking on a, a vertical established solid writing instruction program uh, K twelve. Uh, if that's something that we should be focusing on uh, as a district. I certainly would look forward to given the opportunity to uh, take this position for you and I to sit down and, and, and meet. It sounds like maybe this is an area that, that you have some uh, definitive thoughts and ideas, but again, it, it's not an area that um, uh, is at this point in, under, in my strength or that I'm, that I'm uh, qualified to give you a, a, an answer for right now. I feel it's better to be honest with you than ramble. So I'll stop rambling. Thank you. Um, this from Kim Denoyer, who's a parent. What do you perceive as the reason that our state continues to struggle in regard to student achievement as compared to other states um, nationwide? Um, what research have you done on uh, other states and um, what may you be able to offer in terms of what you've learned from others uh, in other states uh, that could benefit South Lyon schools? Thank you. Uh, I think in, in looking at this and by, by comparison to uh, other states, one of the things that's been uh, evident and, and highlighted in um, the two significant uh, school finance uh, studies that are available right now is that by comparison, uh, Michigan is grossly underfunded uh, as, as, a, as a school system. And I think that in order to support the appropriate um, programs and resources and training that cost dollars. And um, I, I think that the 
inadequacy funding for schools um, is is a significant place where we need to start um, in order to uh, elevate our scores uh, in comparison to the to the states uh, around us. So again, um, the the research and things that that I'm most familiar right, with right now uh, relates to um, school finance and school funding. Thank you. Um, from Brad Gibbons, parents. As an elementary school parent, our kids are getting a very short time of exposure to their school library, music classes, and art. As STEAM curriculum becomes a higher influence in districts across the country, what will you do to increase the amount of time spent in these learning environments? Yeah, that, that's a, also a very good question. And we saw this at the secondary level when the Michigan Merit curriculum uh, came in. The graduation requirements uh, went up and our elective opportunities uh, for students were just about cut in half if they if they weren't cut in half. And so that was that was pretty significant. We took what was a very well-rounded education and now we put it uh, into a very uh, tight window. Um, and with what you're talking about, uh, Mr. Gibbons, with respect to uh, STEAM opportunities, um, I, I think it's looking at how we can or what we need to do. I, I'm not that familiar with Southline in terms of how our specials are, are structured. Uh, certainly um, providing opportunities as we look at being in a very technical, very information rich environment. Um, we'll, we need to be providing opportunities for students uh, in the STEM related uh, areas. Uh, in Livonia, we just began implementing Project Lead the Way um, which is a, a STEM centered focus uh, at our high school and middle schools and are looking to add that uh, next year uh, into our sixth grade uh, curriculum. Uh, don't repeat that if it's coming out probably in budget conversations coming up in the in the weeks ahead. But I think it's taking advantage of, of opportunities uh, like a project lead the way or something like it uh, to complement and supplement uh, our current instructional programs. But it's a it's a it's a puzzle um, because there are a lot of competing interests, and I think it's staying on top of what types of experiences we as a community believe we want to, we need to provide our students, and then providing them. Thank you. Um, I see that it's six forty eight. We have uh, twelve minutes remaining. Um, before it slips to my mind, I want to go back to budget question that was asked previously and, and maybe take a shot and I may be um, misinterpreting it as well so but I'm going to take a chance on, on a different way in, in terms of what I think it is meaning to ask um, so um, are there specific during tough uh, financial times when you, the districts that you've been part of have gone through budget reductions um, are there specific reductions that you um, strongly advocated for um above others no ab absolutely uh, we again I, I mentioned this before i don't know i mentioned it here uh in livonia we had cut about 50 million dollars out of a roughly 150 million dollar budget from 2003 to 2012. i'm sorry yeah no, right right around that time about a 10 year 10 to 12 year period i'm not sure my years there added up but it's also irrelevant um $50 million over 10 to 12 year period. We did that in a way while also preserving programs and services for students. As we would sit as building principals at the time and have conversation about what to cut. First, we would look at what the mandatory expenses are in the budget and, and, and those are what they are. And we really can't take those for consideration. So we have to set those aside. And then what we're left with, we have to evaluate our priorities and what we want to maintain and where we can reduce. In areas where I have fought vehemently uh, to protect um, our, our uh, supports for students with respect to our student assistance uh, provider course, they work with some of our uh, most at-risk students uh, at our secondary schools. And I, I feel quite actually very confidently that it was because of my advocacy uh, in the district that we uh, were able to maintain uh, that very important position and since then have expanded it down into uh, our middle schools 
um, as well as uh, while we have reduced uh, enrollment and some of our uh, numbers of sections and courses um, are less, we have worked very hard to maintain our counseling uh, staff at the ratios that were, they were prior to experiencing the declining enrollment. Because I think um, in addition to classroom instruction as we're focusing on uh, educating the whole child in um, alike, we, our students need to have those support services because if they are not ready emotionally to learn, they, they just aren't gonna be able to. And so we have to have the support and services in place to work with our students and get them emotionally ready dealing with trauma, stress, whatever it is that they're dealing with in order for them to perform, if not at their best, perhaps at all. Um, and so counseling or student supports is something that I have uh, um, consistently fought for um, throughout our, our lean, lean years. I had to add some other things, uh, student uh, safety and security. Um, we found some creative ways to be able to uh, maintain security. Um, and uh, I've, I've fought uh, for that as well. So again, uh, Mr. King, I apologize uh, if uh, through Mr. Severi or I that we have uh, missed the mark on, on your question, but hopefully we've given you a sense of, of how I would prioritize uh, going through some difficult budget uh, uh, situations. Thank you. Um, are you aware of uh, successful practices in uh, high achieving districts in the area that um, could potentially be implemented in uh, South Lyon schools? In order to give a, a, a very accurate answer to that, in all honesty, I have to understand what we have or don't have um, in, in South Lyon to, to be able to give you a, a complete answer with that. So again, I'm, I'm going to apologize. I'm, I'm truthfully not trying to dodge the question, but um, if I put out some things that, that are, are working or, or aren't working, um, I, I'll tell you, I guess I'll offer a couple. Um, you know, it started back with uh, professional learning communities and the pyramid of intervention to make sure that we're able to meet students where they are and provide the necessary interventions. Uh, to help impact their learning. Um, that has since migrated to perhaps you for, you know, response to intervention and MTSS. I think we're having, uh, districts are having a great deal of success uh, with student achievement uh, with those practices. My assumptions would be that, that we have those programs or services uh, like that in uh, South Lyon. If we didn't, certainly having some type of, no matter what letters you put on it, some type of systematic approach to be able to meet students where they are and provide necessary um, supports uh, and resources to help impact and improve their achievement um, is uh, something that uh, I would I would work towards. I also know that districts are having a great deal of success, though it's maybe relatively early with uh, literacy coaches and instructional coaches. I know that you have those things in place in South Lyon, um, and especially working at the at the early grades. Um, and uh, making sure that our students, you know, it's foundational. The, the importance of, of liter early literacy and, and reading comprehension and reading in those early grades. Um, and in many cases, you, you never catch up uh, with some of those deficits. So our, our priority and focus uh, needs to be um, with their early literacy um, and obviously at the, at the early grades. Thank you. Um, and we have, uh about six minutes remaining. So I'm going to ask uh, one additional question and then want to leave a little bit of time for you to make some closing remarks as well. Uh, this is from Lori O'Dell, who's a parent and uh, very uh, straightforward, uh, short question, quantity versus quality. What will you stress for our students? Quality. Quality. We're going to take what we do and do it extremely well. Um, I think if we if we strive for quantity, and I would love to be able to achieve both. If I strive strive for quantity, um, I may not reach the quality. So what I'll tell you is, um, again, it's quality. What we do, we will do extremely well. All right, thank you. So with that, um, Archibald, I do want to give you the opportunity to make uh, some closing comments to the folks watching and listening in. 
thank you again to to all of you for attending tonight and to to put in uh, your very thought provoking questions. Uh, I think the conclusion of tonight ends my fifth hour, sixth hour of interviewing, and I feel very confident to say that the most uh, challenging uh, group of questions um, has been from from this group and. Um, now, perhaps I've just insulted uh, all the other groups, and that certainly wasn't what I was trying to do. So um, I will shift the blame on that to me and say that um, all the questions have been thought provoking, but the ones that have pushed my thinking the most um, and what I see I need to do as superintendent uh, have come from this group. And so I, I certainly appreciate that, uh, that pushing. Um, uh, something that I did not mention that I uh, did when I was principal at Stevenson uh, was I had a parent advisory council and any parent was welcome to attend. And those meetings, I didn't set the agenda. The parents came to the meeting. We went around the table. I was the only person that we could say anything negative about because others weren't there to defend themselves. Um, although I did discourage that, but uh, we went around the table and, and what was on the minds of parents at that time is what our agenda item was. And then we went through item by item and had opportunity to have discussion to get their input it was a tremendous sounding board for me as principal to hear what was on the minds of our parents uh, at the time and to understand you talked about communication early on. I would often bring communication that I was going to send out to the community to that group because I had in my mind what I thought the message was, but I needed them to read it with fresh eyes and a fresh mind and give me feedback. And they could say, Steve, I know that you meant this, but this is really how I think parents are going to interpret or how I interpret. And I was able to refine things. I bring up that example to say this and that you're a, a, this is a partnership and feedback from the community. Whatever that feedback is, I'm never going to give you a false promise that we'll be able to act on it immediately. But I will tell you, as a school community, we're going to work together to set priorities, to align our resources, to, to address those priorities, and to always work to provide the best quality education that we can for all of our students. We can only do that if we're working together and pulling in the same direction. And I feel confident from what I've learned about this community, what I've learned from talking with the, the groups tonight and throughout this process, that the, the community interest and engagement in how you value education and the educational experience uh, for our students is exactly the reason that I want to be your next superintendent. Uh, I do believe that my breadth and uh, depth of my experience and, and all that great fortune I've had so far in my career has position me, positioned me well for this. I assure you as a community that we will have bumps along the way, but that we will always work to take where we are. We're never satisfied. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. You're never staying the same. As a school community, we will always work to improve our current position. There is no more important work that we do than the work that we do with our young students and our students for their future. There is just no more important uh, resource that we have than our students. I, I am, um, again, humbled to be this far in the process. I, again, welcome and thank you for your input and insights and questions uh, tonight. I want nothing more than to join Southland Community Schools as your next superintendent. As I've said to other groups, more importantly than that for me, I give wish the board my best wishes so that they make a choice and selection that is in the best interest of this school community um, in moving forward. And again, uh, I hope at the end of this, it's me. But in any case, I wish you nothing but the best of luck. Uh, however this ends up, I'm your new biggest fan, and, and I wish you well. And thank you for tuning in this evening. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. Um, I want to thank those of you who were um, watching and listening in this evening as well. Um, thank you for submitting the questions also. It was very helpful and uh, enlightening. Um, a reminder to please provide feedback uh, to the board per the link provided. And uh, hope to see all of you folks back with us again tomorrow night at the same time. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Stay well.